Hello, I'm Dan Koritskis from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, and I'm going to provide an update on data regarding the therapeutics of COVID-19 that were presented at the recent virtual CROI 2021. There were a lot of data about the use of monoclonal antibodies, both as prevention and as treatment. And one of the landmark studies pre presented by uh, Myron Cohen from University of North Carolina was the BLAZE-2 trial. Now, this is an ongoing phase three randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, single-dose study of the monoclonal bamlanivimab uh, in nursing home settings for the prevention of COVID-19 infection and disease. This was an extraordinary study because it was done really with mobile vans running out to sites where a, there had been a confirmed case uh, at a nursing home. They then rapidly uh, stood up the study at that site and randomized both the residents of the nursing home as well as staff at the nursing home to uh, receive the antibody or placebo and then follow them for 24 weeks with the primary endpoint being incidents of COVID uh, related symptoms uh, confirmed by RT-PCR as having disease uh, or worse within eight weeks. They uh, enrolled uh, nearly 1200 participants and you can see the data on uh, the baseline demographics on this slide. The um, about 30% of the participants were age 65 and older among the staff. Uh, when you looked at everybody there, about 75% were women, but about 60% uh, of the residents. Uh, there was a good, uh, but not perfect uh, mix of demographics, uh, for predominantly white residents and staff, but with about 8% uh, African-American and 5% and uh, Hispanic or Latino. Uh, and they were uh, just borderline obese with a BMI of about uh, 30. 60% uh, of the participants uh, when you took everybody together and 100% of the participants when you look just at the rest of uh, the nursing home residents were considered high risk. And these are the results. Uh, looking simply at the residents, and this was a pre-specified analysis, these were, this was the prevention population, you can see that there was a significant reduction in the risk of uh, developing uh, symptomatic COVID-19. Uh, and that translated to an 80% reduction in the risk of developing COVID. Uh, there were no deaths among the residents who received bamlanivimab as compared to uh, four uh, in the placebo group. Now, if we looked at the entire group of high-risk uh, participants with uh, uh, symptomatic COVID-19, uh, you can see that there was still a significant uh, uh, benefit of bamlanivimab uh, with about a 70% per, uh, reduction in the risk of uh, contracting um, COVID-19. A uh, similar study was done with a cocktail of antibodies, uh, cazarivimab and um, uh, imdevimab for COVID-19 prevention. And what we heard were uh, presented by uh, Megan O'Brien from Regeneron were the uh, interim uh, results of the first 410 or so of participants uh, in an ongoing phase three randomized placebo controlled uh, trial, uh, all the uh, people were asymptomatic and had to be PCR negative for uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well as seronegative uh, at the time of enrollment. Uh, here, the assessment was based on the proportion of uh, participants who developed uh, PCR confirmed uh, COVID-19, uh, whether they were symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, during a uh, one month uh, efficacy assessment period. And so here in contrast to the bamlanivimab study we just heard about, there was a regular collection of nasopharyngeal oral pharyngeal uh, nasal swabs or uh, saliva to assess the presence of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And of course, safety was uh, being assessed as well. Uh, and so participants were randomized uh, to receive the antibody cocktail or placebo. Um, the primary endpoint was at the end of a month, and then there's an additional uh, seven month uh, follow-up period. The, uh, this was a somewhat younger group than uh, in the bamlanivimab study. Uh, the median age was about 45. Uh, half the participants were uh, women. Uh, this study did much better in terms of uh, uh, distribution of uh, minorities, including uh, roughly 46 to 50 percent of being Hispano or uh, Hispanic or Latino, uh, and about uh, 12 percent overall were uh, Black or African American. Um, this was also a, um, a much uh, a, a similarly uh, uh, 
borderline obese group with a, a median weight of about 82 kilos, uh, which put their BMI at just under 30, which is of course the definition of uh, obesity. So uh, as in the bamlanivimab study, there was a significant protective effect of the um, antibody cocktail uh, in this study, uh, passive immunization with the Regen Cove, which is the name of the combination of product, uh, resulted in 100% protection of, uh, against symptomatic infection and 100% prevention of uh, high titer virus infection with about 50% lower rates of infection uh, overall. So on the left-hand side, we see uh, the results for prevention of symptomatic PCR positive infection or a high titer infection, meaning uh, virus loads that were uh, greater than 10 to the fourth copies. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you see the prevention of any uh, PCR positive infection, uh, where there was about a 50% reduction. And this includes uh, symptomatic or, or asymptomatic cases. So that was prevention. Now, what about uh, therapy? Well, well, there was another very important study uh, presented uh, on the use of uh, combination antibodies for the treatment of uh, COVID-19 in high-risk ambulatory patients. And this was the combination of bamlanivimab plus etazivimab, the, the two antibodies uh, that are uh, given in combination and that target different epitopes. Uh, so these are both uh, IgG1 uh, subtype uh, antibodies. Uh, they are both uh, derived from uh, people who have recovered from uh, COVID-19, uh, bamlanivimab uh, from a patient in the US and etazivimab from a, a patient in China. Uh, as you can see, uh, they, although they target the receptor binding domain, they target separate epitopes in the, in the RBD. Uh, and of course they block uh, entry of the, of the virus. Um, there are uh, many data on bamlanivimab, including the prevention study uh, that we just saw. Uh, and uh, for etazivimab, uh, there are assays uh, in vitro as well as uh, studies showing protection uh, in the non-human uh, population, but we really don't have uh, any data about etazivimab as a single antibody uh, in uh, human populations. Uh, so this was the phase three component of the BLAZE-1 study. Uh, in the phase two component, the three different uh, doses of bamlanivimab as uh, monotherapy, as well as a combination dose of bamlanivimab and etazivimab uh, versus placebo were studied. And these results have previously been uh, published and we have discussed those uh, on the previous virology education programs. Uh, new here was the phase three portion, which looked at a combination of the two antibodies given at uh, 2,800 milligrams each as compared to placebo. Uh, there's an ongoing parallel phase three uh, study using uh, much lower doses of bamlanivimab uh, and adazivimab. So here are the baseline demographics. Uh, they had a good uh, gender balance. About a third of the, uh, uh, of the uh, entrants were uh, Hispanic or Latino. About uh, eight or 9% were Black or African American. Um, median age was uh, uh, in the mid 50s with 30% uh, being uh, age 65 or older. Uh, they were an obese group, but this is partly by design because that was one of the risk factors that made you eligible for a study. Uh, so 33 or 34%, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, mean body mass index was 33 or 34. Um, there was uh, mild uh, uh, COVID symptoms in about uh, three quarters of the participants uh, and uh, about 20 to 25% had moderate uh, symptoms. Uh, people had to be treated within a, a short period of their symptoms developing. And so not surprisingly, the mean duration of symptoms was only uh, four days. Uh, and the mean um, uh, CT value was 24, uh, which uh, can be uh, translated into a, a virus load. These are the data. There was a 70% reduction in the risk of hospitalization among the participants who received uh, the antibody combination. Uh, and uh, that uh, was a highly significant difference. Uh, there was also a, uh, a significant uh, difference in the rates of hospitalization or all-cause mortality, uh, as you can see, which was a 70% reduction uh, compared to placebo. And if we look just at deaths, there were no deaths in the combination group uh, as opposed to 10 deaths in the placebo group or 2% uh, versus uh, zero. Uh, that's uh, too small a difference to be uh, assessed statistically, but nevertheless, an important uh, numerical difference. 
Before uh, talking about other uh, uh, drugs, I just want to mention that, of course, the challenge with the antibodies is that as we see viral variants emerge, we have to be concerned that uh, some of the new variants may be uh, resistant to these antibodies. Uh, and we know that the uh, variants carrying the E484K mutation, uh, which characterize uh, viruses uh, that have been uh, circulating in uh, Southern Africa, as well as in Brazil, and now present uh, in many other countries, uh, are resistant to bamlanivimab, uh, uh, which means that the combination is really just edizivimab by itself if uh, being used to treat an, a, um, uh, one of those variants. Uh, the Regeneron uh, uh, antibodies appear to re retain uh, reduced activity, but still activity against uh, those variants. Well, what about novel small molecules? Uh, there uh, were data presented about uh, the drug that has uh, previously been known as EIDD2801 or MK4482, now known as molnupiravir. Uh, this is an orally bioavailable ribonucleoside analog, uh, so a similar class of drug as uh, remdesivir, uh, uh, and like remdesivir has activity against a wide range of RNA viruses. Uh, this drug works through lethal mutagenesis. That is, it induces mutations in the virus uh, at, at, to a point where the um, uh, virus uh, be, has so many mutations that it is no longer uh, replication competent. And you can see these data from uh, in vitro uh, uh, studies showing a dramatic reduction in uh, the um, uh, production of uh, virus in, in tissue culture with an EC50 of about uh, three and a half uh, micromolar. Uh, Molnupiravir was studied in uh, uh, the uh, animal model, uh, showing that it was uh, effective in uh, uh, treating. Uh, you can see here um, the animals were uh, in infected at uh, day zero and then uh, treated with uh, two different doses of uh, molnupiravir, uh, sampled both in blood and uh, nasal lavage. Uh, and uh, uh, shown on, in the graph on the right, uh, you see the reduction in the uh, titers of uh, virus uh, in the animals who received uh, dosing of um, molnupiravir. Another uh, small molecule that is in uh, clinical trials and is now uh, uh, entering into the uh, ACTIV-2 study being conducted in the United States by uh, the uh, ACTG, but is also being studied in the Camelot trial uh, is uh, Camostat mesylate. Uh, this is a protease inhibitor that interferes with uh, the Temper SS2, a host protease needed to process the spike protein of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, at the time of virus entry. Uh, and uh, in it, this drug has been used in Japan for uh, nearly three decades for the treatment of pancreatitis and is known to be uh, safe and well tolerated. Uh, and uh, this drug has activity against MERS, SARS, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in, uh, in the laboratory uh, and has had, uh, is now, as I mentioned, in clinical trials. There is uh, some uh, concern about whether this will be fully active uh, against uh, SARS because there are alternative proteases, particularly cathepsin B, uh, that can substitute for temper SS2. And so we'll have to see what the clinical trials show us. Let me turn quickly to uh, discussing um, viral evolution, because as we hear about the increasing variety of uh, viral variants that are circulating, um, this is cause for concern, both with respect to the uh, efficacy of, uh, of the vaccines that are being rolled out, as well as the therapeutic uh, utility of some of the monoclonal antibodies that we were just discussing. Betty Korber gave a terrific presentation uh, contrasting the diversity uh, seen uh, with HIV uh, as compared to the diversity seen with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go over the, uh, all of the details uh, in this slide except to present the visual image that the uh, top row uh, shows the uh, variation in envelope with HIV uh, and the variation in the CD4 binding region. And just uh, every one of these colored uh, dots or, or colored uh, uh, lines here represent regions of variation. Uh, and here in the lower row uh, is the same kind of plot, but for the SARS-CoV-2 gene of the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, and uh, the variation in the uh, ACE2 binding region, the uh, receptor binding domain. And you can just uh, see at a glance how much less variation there is. But there is still variation that occurs. 
And we know that um, there has been uh, considerable variation of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, since its introduction into the human population. And it's important to keep in mind that even if the rate of mutation per round of replication with coronaviruses is much, much lower uh, than it is for HIV, within the first year of the, corona, of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen um, between 120 and 130 million people infected worldwide, which is roughly three times the number of people currently living with HIV. So what the virus lacks uh, in terms of uh, mutation rate, it compensates for by this huge number of infections. So any favorable mutation that get made, gets made is rapidly subject to enormous selection pressure in terms of transmission efficiency. And you can see in this graph how similar variants have emerged uh, at different times in different geographic regions, uh, an, an example of convergent uh, evolution where the E484K variant has uh, emerged uh, uh, rarely but repeatedly uh, in uh, different variants, including in the uh, B1351 variant, the P1 variant, and more recently in variants uh, recovered in uh, New York City uh, as well. Uh, the first uh, major variant to emerge was the D614G variant uh, uh, in the spike protein. Uh, and you can see how this variant has rapidly taken over the population. Uh, this was the situation in March of last year, where uh, maybe half of the viruses uh, carried the, the D14, D614G variant. And uh, by the end of January, uh, virtually all of the um, variants carried it. Now, this variant is more infectious and more transmissible. Um, it uh, is able to uh, more effectively bind the ACE2 uh, receptor and undergo fusion, it results in higher virus loads, um, um, not apparently more lethal uh, than the other variants, and it's not resistant to neutralization. The P1 variant, uh, however, uh, which has been circulating now in Manaus in Brazil uh, since uh, December is really quite concerning for several reasons. Uh, one, uh, this variant in, uh, in the laboratory, uh, because it carries the E484K mutation, uh, is resistant to uh, 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 neutralization by uh, several of the uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, it is less neutralizable by uh, antibodies induced by vaccines to the um, uh, predominant uh, spike protein. But most concerning is that uh, it had been thought that there was herd immunity in Manaus because about 70% of the population uh, carried uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibody uh, following the previous surge uh, in, uh, uh, earlier in 2020. And, and many people uh, became reinfected now with the P1 variant, uh, suggesting that uh, this variant is resistant to immunity acquired during the, the first wave. A vaccination does appear to pr provide better protection against this variant than prior infection, but just how protective a vaccination may be uh, is still being studied. Also, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 variant known as the 501Y uh, V2 variant escapes uh, uh, neutralization by um, plasma uh, collected from uh, South African uh, donors who had recovered from COVID-19. So uh, very much like the story uh, in Manaus. And you can see uh, the reduction in neutralizing titer uh, uh, comparing the original uh, virus that was circulating to this newer uh, variant. And the implications for uh, immune escape of uh, vaccine efficacy uh, are really uh, quite uh, troublesome. So how well do vaccines, sera neutralize the 501YV2 variant? Uh, you can see here that uh, serum from uh, uh, people who uh, were vaccinated with the uh, AstraZeneca or uh, the Oxford uh, chimp adenovirus uh, vaccine uh, had good neutralizing titers against the um, original virus, uh, but very low titers against the 501YV2 variant. And in a clinical trial, uh, published just a few days ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, you can see that when the um, chimp adenovirus vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine was studied in South Africa, uh, there was essentially no protection against uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, due to the currently circulating variant, uh, uh, although there may have been some protection against severe disease, uh, but this is really quite troubling uh, and uh, 
supports the decision by the South African government and health authorities uh, not to continue distribution of the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine uh, in that country. So that brings me to the end of my presentation and I'll be happy to take your uh, questions when we get to our roundtable discussion.